What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki? Part 10. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. However, I had to divert my attention further as first one of my clones dispersed, and then the second. While the death of the first from a powerful blow to the head could still be understood, the instant incineration of the second made me wary. Unfortunately, everything happened too quickly to understand what killed the copy, but it certainly wasn't fire, as there was no flash of light. And Iwagakure isn't particularly fond of fire, preferring Dotan. But then, thoughts had to abruptly cease. As not far from me, there was a surge of chakra. Only at the last moment did I move away, abandoning the technique and attempting to dodge the attack. Yet, I only managed to move slightly aside from the trajectory of the flying projectile, which grazed my back, leaving behind a trail of scorched clothing and charred skin. Ignoring the blinding pain and the smell of burning flesh, I evaded the next projectile of molten lava just in time and cursed inwardly. Of course, it had to be the only one who escaped the enemy's trap to also possess Lava Kekiai Genkai and even be a sensor, disabling nerve sensitivity in the damaged part of my back and quietly appreciating the reflex to constantly infuse my body with chakra, which allowed only the top layer of muscle fibers and burnt skin to suffer. I swiftly discarded the useless cloak designed for much weaker attacks and pulled out a couple of kanai from the hip pouch, immediately sending them towards a jonin. Naturally, I missed, but that was not my goal. I formed the snake seal with my right hand. Exploding clay, C4. The explosive tags attached to the ends of the projectiles gave me enough time to move behind a large rock, using it as cover from techniques. And for a moment, I glanced towards my partner, confirming my own sensations. Ichiya managed to eliminate two Jonin with certainty, but he had to fight the last one without the cheating ability of the Nara. Holding out until the very end, ignoring the obvious danger, wasn't in vain. I would now be dealing with two strong shinobi each instead of just one. But my opponent didn't wait for me to check on my partner's condition and switch to heavier artillery. Noticing my chosen rock, a wave of lava surged towards it, forcing me to quickly retreat. Substitution technique. Replacing myself with a prepared stone, I immediately threw more kanai with exploding clay and, under the cover of explosions, attempted to catch the opponent in the shadows. Attempted being the key word, despite my speed advantage, this bastard was incredibly agile and almost managed to escape the blast radius, simultaneously noticing a dark streak heading towards him. Dodging a barrage of lava spit, I was forced to worry about my own skin safety, interrupting the hizutsu and diving into the nearest cover. Damn it, I'm low on chakra and further use of techniques won't help. This bastard is faster than many of our jonin, and without chakra enhancement, he could easily get to me. Moving behind another rocky outcrop to avoid the scorching splashes that covered the position from above, I mentally recalculated my remaining arsenal and grimace. I still had plenty of regular kanai in my seals, but I had only about a dozen C4 and a few barrier and paralysis tags. It's fortunate that my opponent also lacks a weapon reserve, preferring to spin chakra rather than bombard me with iron, which would have had the same effect, but without depleting his reserves. However, soon he'll have problems using something costly like the recent wave. I just need to hold out until then, if our reinforcements don't arrive from camp by then, since my partner managed to warn them about the new enemies, and trap the Iwagakure ninja in taijutsu, using my superiority in raw strength and endurance. There's just one problem, getting into melee range without turning into a crispy treat. And despite my advantage, I don't particularly want to get closer. This lava user executes his techniques almost without seals or automatic name pronunciations. Self-training and reflexes are key. Meaning there's a high chance of getting a lump of lava in the face in full contact. 
as I love to do with Suedun, Tepidama. Plus, this bastard uses the terrain better for cover. So that's what familiar territory means. Emerging from behind the cover of a low boulder, I threw a couple of gifts towards the ninja who had been lurking there, and as soon as he changed position, I sent a fan of specially reserved poison senbons in his direction, sincerely hoping that this bastard wouldn't notice a couple in the darkness and would gift me an easy victory. Despite the work of Chikatsu Size, no jutsu and decent regeneration, I need to treat my wound as soon as possible, and especially avoid jumping across rocks, straining already damaged muscles. For now, we're in a deadlock. He has no weapons but some chakra left for jutsu. While I have little chakra, but enough throwing weapons for long-range combat. Ah, and we're both sensors, forced to stay not far from each other, so the enemy doesn't go to help his partner, but also unable to engage in close combat. Well, I'm hesitant to engage, and he's cautious, remembering my hizutsu. However, amidst our own considerations, we somehow overlook the state of affairs in the main camp, and most likely simultaneously notice the approach of a dozen sources of chakra from that side as well as the overall diminishing sounds of battle. Focusing, I identified some of the jonin who possess the most vivid elemental affinity with fire, clearly indicating a couple of Uchihas. So our side won, and they've come to assist. It seems the wielder of Kekiai Jenkai came to similar conclusions, and, no longer paying attention to me, turned around and began to dash straight in the opposite direction at full speed. Sighing with relief, I lean my shoulder against the cold stone and wipe the sweat from my brow. Screw it, golden fish, the main thing is I'm alive and relatively intact. There was a pretty big chance of losing to this clan shinobi and ending up as a charred corpse right here. Of course, I still have a couple of aces up my sleeve, but even a large amount of chakra won't help if you're buried under a thick layer of lava. And the years of accumulation in the seal on my forehead should be saved for stronger opponents than some IWA clan fighter. Unfortunately, my elements aren't much help against such Kekiai Jenkai, unlike Dotan. As soon as I return to the village, I'll work on setting up good defensive barriers based on chakra chains as a universal defense against all kinds of mixed elements, for which Suedun and Raidun won't suffice. Narasan, are you all right? The shinobi who landed next to me recognized me almost immediately. Not great, but I'll be soon. I grimaced, returning feeling to my back and creating a clone that immediately began to heal it. The wounded are under a barrier, but I won't be of much use in the next few hours, so the sooner you get to my clones, the more chakra they'll have left to aid the injured. Understood. The jonin immediately used his radio to pass on the received information to the others. Well, another sortie has ended for me albeit on a somewhat larger scale than usual. I can't say I'm satisfied with the outcome. Let's just say, the first serious injury with a burn dangerous even for a shinobi, but considering that facing a dozen opponents with just one partner, I'm still alive, it's a worthy result. Waiting until the shadow clone of the Kage exhausts all its chakra and patches me up a bit, I headed towards the devastated IWA camp under the guard of an unfamiliar jonin. Just another episode in the war. How many more will there be? This time we were lucky to catch the enemy camp off guard. However, no one guarantees that after some time, the Wagakure Shinobi won't set a trap on another raid, simply burying our troops in one of the canyons with a landslide. It's happened before. Unlike the Land of Fire, the Land of Stone is much better suited for unexpected attacks and ambushes, and the enemy here has a significant advantage, despite the qualitative superiority of our fighters. Struggling to open my eyes, I even grimaced at the dull, throbbing pain in my head and the dry desert in my mouth. Ugh, I feel awful. What happened yesterday? Without attempting to move, as I sensed it wouldn't help, I began transforming chakra in a medical treatment around my head and felt relief as the pain began to subside. Touching the seal with my tongue, I also gained access to a mouthful of the purest water and eagerly began to gulp it down moistening my parched throat. Along with improving my condition, some memories of yesterday began to return, and it became clear I was drinking. I drank together with everyone celebrating a successful raid and commemorating the 11 deceased shinobi out of the 60 for whom medical aid was no longer needed. Another 18 were seriously wounded. Among them, three lost limbs, and for two, 
Organs had to be transplanted on the spot from the cooling bodies of enemies. Not to mention the lightly wounded, whose number equaled the remaining shinobi. None emerged and scathed. And this is considered one of the best outcomes, considering almost three and a half hundred Awagakure shinobi corpses. Of course, among them, there were no more than two dozen jonin, including those that fell to us and Ichi, and the majority fell to Chunin and Jinin, but still, the loss ratio turned out to be very favorable for the scale of such an operation. As more experienced colleagues explained to me, under similar conditions, losses usually exceed 50% of the strike group's personnel, and barely a tenth of the seriously wounded make it to our camp without immediate medical assistance. Even if Irionine were present on the battlefield, they usually were removed without counting the losses. So everyone was feeding me and thanking me, expressing their gratitude to those who were half in the grave, but whom I and my clones managed to pull out and even patch up decently a couple of days after returning. They won't be fighting soon, but most could move around the camp without problems, giving me a firm promise not to strain myself and not to use chakra. And if I remember the amount of effort I had to put in just to get drunk, the medical seal perceives a large amount of alcohol in the body as a weak poison and almost instantly neutralizes it. And considering my body mass and increased resistance to toxic substances, it's quite a challenge even without the seal disabled. Letting out a relieved sigh when the consequences of the wild hangover passed, I revisited the rest of my body attached to my head and was stunned by the awakening sensations previously disregarded. Too hot, naked female bodies were tightly pressed against me on either side, literally crawling on top in search of warmth, since it was quite chilly in the tent and we lay uncovered. Lowering my gaze from the fabric ceiling, I discovered with comfort that two dark-haired manies had settled on my chest, one of which I knew very well. Some cold sweat ran down my spine. If her father finds out, he'll castrate me. And one should beware of the Kunoichi's reaction herself, remembering our usual armed neutrality relationship, despite some warming in recent months. Now it only remains to understand how my partner ended up not alone, but in the company of Hugo. Damn it. No matter how I avoid this clan, one of its representatives with a clear forehead ended up in my bed. However, this seems to be the Jonin I patched up during the battle. And now I begin to recall that by the end of our joint drinking spree, she wanted to personally express her gratitude in a very vivid way, and I didn't object, considering that from the very beginning of our deployment, I didn't drag anyone into bed due to the extreme workload on the only normal Irionine in the camp. There's nothing surprising here. And the Kunoichi looked very appetizing, despite her second size. It's just that we were unlucky to stumble upon the completely drunk Inazuka, who started questioning where we were headed. I even blushed a bit, remembering how my companion explained to Tsum what we were going to do in my tent. The only thing I didn't expect was the dog lady who asked to join us, obviously under the influence of alcohol, who had turned off the last of her breaks. What followed could well qualify as the three X's on the most depraved pornography. Suffice it to say that I had gotten off for many months of abstinence, and my medical skills had not lost much in effectiveness even because of my drunken state, so the Kunoichi had gotten all the maximum possible pleasure. I could only be glad of the soundproofing of my tent, as the girls were not the quietest of my partners. Far from the quietest. I tried to pull myself up and free myself from the girls' tight embrace, but it was difficult, not only because of the Kunoichi's clinginess and strength, but also because of the skin that was unpleasantly stuck to the sheet. I'd had my back slashed pretty badly yesterday, especially by Tsum, but Hugo was good too. It had healed on its own, even without the seal on, but it was a little uncomfortable with the dried fabric. Sighing, I gave up on starting the day and just lay there, enjoying the warmth of my partners. But even after an hour, the sweet couple didn't deign to return to the world of the living. I was about to follow suit, but I was prevented from doing so by the familiar voice of my infirmary assistant outside. Nara-sensei, are you up? And judging by the slightly nervous sound of the Uchiha's voice, the news I was about to receive was not very good. Yes, yes, I'll be right out, I said, removing the one-way sound barrier with the key seal. Gently but firmly, I pulled away from the grumbling Kunoichi, who had begun to wake up and found my pants in the pile of clothes scattered around the tent and crawled out, 
squinting against the morning sun. What's wrong, Shifuyu-chan? inquired the assistant. The Uchiha, who wanted to answer me, froze with her mouth open, her gaze running down her naked torso and fixed on her face. I raised an eyebrow questioningly, not understanding the reason for the girl's hesitation. Only the next moment she made it clear. Why, senpai, I didn't expect you to be so handsome under your mask. The assistant's eyes sparkled with excitement. I reproduced the hand face, gesture, and only then realized that the usual mask was not on my face. And I remembered that I had been persuaded to take it off during last night's drunkenness. What I'd learned was that the local kunoichi also liked to chase after handsome guys. But in this world, they didn't just chase to look at them, but to get them into bed. And as soon as possible, and sometimes even with the use of force. I've seen in my time the organized hunts for the most handsome representatives of the I clans. So, less idle chatter and more to the point. I sighed doomfully, anticipating future hemorrhoids. What did you want to tell me? Oh, Akamichi Yano got worse in the morning, and about 10 minutes ago, there were the first signs of organ rejection. The blush from the Kunoichi's face instantly disappeared and stretched into a string. She hurriedly reported the situation. Shit Biju. Try to stabilize his condition and apply medical chakra to his liver to slow down the process. And I'll be right there. The Uchiha commanded. And without paying any more attention to her, he hurried back to the tent and began to dress. I couldn't just run away like that. As my girls woke up and demanded my attention, suffering from the same hangover symptoms as I had just a little earlier. They didn't even bother about their clothing, or rather, its complete absence, and the fact that there was a similar neighbor nearby. Getting rid of these trifles took just a couple of seconds. My presence is needed in the infirmary, so I'm off. I informed the Kunoichi once I was sure they could perceive their surroundings. Without waiting for a response, I dashed out of the tent, only slowing down briefly at the threshold. Oh, and thanks for the wonderful night. Out of the corner of my eye, I managed to catch Tsum's stunned expression, gradually turning as red as a ripe tomato. Hyuga just smirked contentedly and winked in response to my statement. Nearly sprinting to the critically wounded, I immediately began diagnostics, trying not to interfere with Shifuyu's actions. Akamichi's body was indeed rejecting foreign flesh, which had been transplanted instead of the liver destroyed on the battlefield. It would have been fine if the replacement had been completely unsuitable, but I had deliberately chosen a donor with a matching blood type to make the adaptation easier and gentler for the shinobi. However, the former chubby guy managed to use two of the three forbidden pills before receiving such a serious injury, and he was in extreme physical and chakra exhaustion, now lying unconscious on intravenous nutrition. Thus, his weakened body couldn't properly assimilate the new organ, starting to reject it. Moreover, after a thorough examination, I discovered a small error of my own, caused more by lack of attention at the time. While the donor's blood type matched Akamichi's, the chakra predisposition was earth release instead of the necessary water release, or at least fire release. Water can overcome earth only with overwhelming superiority. Otherwise, it turns out the opposite as it did in this case. Cursing, I gestured for my assistant to continue supporting the wounded, while I retrieved a tightly rolled scroll the size of an elbow from my pocket and, unfurling it, began searching for the required seal. All right, eyes, heart, kidneys, hands, ah, liver. Finding the necessary signature, I retrieved a scroll half the size and three meters long, carefully scanning through the preserved organs scrutinizing my own clumsy notes on the margins just aside from the drawn seals. Any city dweller or ordinary resident of the land of fire would almost certainly condemn such an attitude towards fallen enemies, not to mention the squealing about humanism from the past, but for me a more or less intact enemy body was just a set of spare parts. Yes, I have been working as a butcher since I was eight, entrusted to handle quite complex cases, so I simply don't perceive corpses as former people. There are the living and the dead, and the latter no longer care. But their bodies can still save the living, and the fact that they are our former enemies only eases my not particularly active conscience, but greatly satisfies my sense of justice, however hypertrophied it may be. After about the 20th, I finally found a suitable replacement, though it belonged to a woman, not a man. Well, if it takes hold properly, 
then screw it. This isn't a heart or lung which might fail under stress in a larger body. The main thing is to observe for a couple of months after the transplant and periodically stimulate the liver for better optimization. Unrolling the organ, I cautiously took the replacement, wrapped in a thin layer of chakra. What did you expect? In field conditions, you can't properly disinfect or ensure the sterility of your tools, so you have to resort to sterile chakra, and commanded my assistant to prepare for surgery. Uchiha stopped blood circulation on both sides of the barely visible scar, and with one swift motion, I opened it. Then she closed the liver's connecting vessels to the bloodstream, and with a pair of finger movements, removed it. I immediately dropped the new organ into its place, and had it growing in a couple minutes. Shifuyu carefully began splicing the edges of the wound with my chakra thread. It took about four minutes, and now Akamichi Yano will definitely live, and even remain a shinobi, with proper care in the next six months and regular checkups with a good eye Ryan. I sealed the removed liver in a scroll and made a note of it with the pencil I always carry with me. Excellent work, Shifuyu chan I praised my assistant when the organ bank was sealed again. It's nothing complicated, Sensei. The Kunoichi waved away, stretching her shoulders. How many of these operations we've done in the last few months, so now it's just routine. I let the Uchiha in only when I was sure she'd learned the bare minimum and wouldn't do more damage with her efforts. Since then, a little over two and a half months had passed, and dozens of shinobi had passed through her delicate hands, with my supervision and assistance most of the time. Shifuyu wasn't a real Irionine without a theoretical base, but she'd passed the field medic test with flying colors. In addition, I taught her a little to improve her body for greater survivability, and even put a healing seal so as not to lose such a valuable assistant. The first months I literally sewed up, and then the contingent of the camp began to gradually increase and the amount of work, respectively too, albeit the complexity and lower. By the way, where are those two fools? The Uchiha asked, noting the absence of a couple more helpers. Since the hospital also needed brute force, I hired two guys who had damaged their Kirikuki eye and couldn't use chakra properly in the near future. In exchange for quality restoration, of course, not out of the goodness of my heart. It's good for them and it's good for me to be able to practice for the next degree of Irionine. While you're resting today, they've taken over the second and third shifts. Good. Then I'll leave everything to you. I yawned, waved to my assistant, and headed for the exit of the infirmary. Oh no. Oh. Turning to the Uchiha, I raised an eyebrow questioningly, but following her gaze, I chuckled. All right, let's help the little one. Okay. Sickies, if any of you decide to run away while I'm not around... Don't even think about it. I'll find you and break your arms and legs, so you don't have to go anywhere. You know me. Do you understand? Having waited for a friendly hay from the big age devils that were conscious, I left the infirmary with a feeling of deep satisfaction and, having got out into the street, wandered towards my tent. What kind of people, eh? And most of them are not for the first or even the second time, but they all want to leave as soon as they become somewhat able to move on their own two feet. It's a hassle to deal with such patients. I have to deal with some right now. That's a pain in the ass. As much as I didn't want to go back to my room and deal with the girl's feelings, there was nothing I could do about it. You shabbowinked her. You deal with it. I shouldn't have been thinking with the wrong head under the influence of alcohol last night. To be honest, when Inazuka frowns, growls, and shows her fangs, she's really scary with her animal eyes. And now, sober and without the distorting effect on my mind, I can at least admit to myself that I would be afraid to take her to bed. Well, not afraid, because I'm not even twice as strong as my partner. So she wouldn't hurt me if she wanted to, but I wouldn't dare. Some was the kind of woman who was called a boy babe, in no other way. Even though she was only 14 now, or was it 15 already? She's only 14 now, or is it 15 already? With this shitty war, you forget about everything. But if you remember the source material, she was the leader of the clan, and her husband even ran away from her to become a nuke -neen. And the rudiments of that character can be seen now. Indeed, inside the tent, I was greeted by a slightly different scene than expected. Specifically, Inazuka, visibly agitated and unsure where to put her hands, dressed almost to the point of biting her lower lip. Considering she only does this in moments of extreme agitation or distress, her state of mind was quite understandable. Nevertheless, 
Nobody started threatening me or anything similar, despite my underlying anticipation. Moreover, her body language, legs drawn up, hands on her knees, indicated readiness for a conversation rather than aggression. Hmm. I take it Hyuga disappeared as soon as she got dressed? I asked just to break the silence at the threshold. Yeah. Some replied quietly, still not daring to look up at me. No. This won't do at all. Having already forgotten my own fears, I flopped down onto the futon, which she probably arranged, next to her, and grabbing her waist, I pulled the surprised girl towards me, crossing her into a lotus pose. I also hugged her tightly to prevent any attempt to escape. After all, I completely forgot that I was dealing with an emotionally unstable teenager, war, killings, blood, none of which positively affect a woman's psyche, not a mature and experienced woman. So, about what happened yesterday, there's nothing scary or shameful for either of us. I began, resting my chin on top of the Kunoichi's head and holding her closer to my chest to discourage any thoughts of escaping. The only regrettable thing is that your first time happened under such circumstances and with a slightly larger company than it should have been. But I hope you at least found some pleasure in it. While it was a rhetorical question, some remained silent, and I noticed her ears starting to blush traitorously. However, I didn't need a verbal answer. As for our relationship after yesterday, absolutely nothing has changed and won't change until you decide otherwise. We're still partners, and I have no intention of letting go of jokes or hints. Nor will I try to drag you into bed again. After my words, the girl noticeably relaxed in my embrace. Though she still didn't say anything, the silence was less tense than at the beginning. Mentally, I congratulated myself for choosing the right words and correctly identifying my partner's fears. It remained only to regret that Shinobi didn't have professional psychologists who should handle such cases, instead of me moonlighting halftime. Oh, and don't worry about the consequences of yesterday. I'm sterile. I remembered one more detail. What? This time, Sum didn't remain silent, trying to twist her neck to look me in the face. No, no. I'm capable of having children. It's just that a skilled medic can make themselves infertile without consequences until they decide to leave offspring. I wisely omitted the mention of the seal that guarantees I won't sire children from casual liaisons in any case. Oh, I see. So, I'd suggest you treat casual encounters during wartime or missions much more leniently than those that happen in the village. Immediate danger always stimulates hormones and instincts for progeny as a kind of protective mechanism, preventing our population from dying out. Because if Shinobi didn't have children so early, Kanoha would hardly have half its current fighter contingent. Moreover, this method of pleasure and stress relief is one of the main means to avoid going insane falling into depression, or committing suicide for many shinobi who have experienced the horrors of war. Specifically, take Hyuga who was recently here. She dragged a guy she liked in a bed, got what she wanted, and calmly went about her business afterward. And I can tell you for sure she's already married. There are plenty of such cases. So, this is one of the few ways to relax and relieve tension that is looked upon leniently, unlike drugs or alcohol. Well, the same goes for certain types of tobacco that our Hokage loves to smoke. And I'd prefer you to sleep with me or someone else, using protection of course, rather than consider trying drugs again, without the ability to quickly cleanse your body of that crap. How do you know all this? Some said, making herself comfortable after listening to my little lecture. I think we spent the same amount of time at the front, but I've never heard of anything like this. I didn't learn it here either, but before the war, I said, jokingly flicking the girl on the tip of her nose and immediately pulling my hand away from her teeth. From whom? You have the same new Uchiha working with you at the hospital, so it wasn't her that enlightened you with the sick I doubt you're just chatting for a living. And if you had someone even for one night, I'd definitely smell it, Inazuka grumbled. Oh ho ho ho, so we're monitoring this moment with our partners. I mockingly stretched out, unexpected, from above. I could see the Kunoichi's face flush with a ripe tomato. And I don't keep track, she suddenly stammered, shrinking back and lowering her head like a puddled puppy found at a crime scene. This comparison made me laugh, and I almost said it out loud, but luckily I came to my senses in time. Of course, I could make fun of the poor thing a little, but we never finished talking, so this time Tim was lucky 
but don't expect me to forget about it. When there's more room to maneuver, an escape won't be a problem. Okay. I believe you. A little bit. Oh. The Kunoichi raised her head and slapped my chin in response to the teasing. I learned all this from an experienced Kunoichi who had enlightened me to the realities of camping life beforehand. So, I didn't think you had a barely detectable foreign feminine scent on you back at the academy. Inazuka suddenly exclaimed. And then another during our team meetings. You were already going out with women back then, mentally. I cursed the overly sensitive nose of the dog clan and the too clever mind of my partner, who quickly put two and two together to get the expected picture. By the way, it was you who got the healing seal for free, only because you were on the same team with me. I slapped my palm on the flat tummy of the yelping Kunoichi, but some of the girls couldn't afford it, which led to an agreement that suited both parties. You pay for your work in kind? I chuckled at the amazement in the voice of Tsum, who had twisted around to look me in the face. It's more accurate to say that it was consensual she saw nothing wrong with it, and I got what I wanted despite my age and my inability to visit the red light street legally and without being exposed, as well as very useful information about shinobi life as a bonus. I clarified. But for someone to agree, I don't know if you're aware of it. But it's hard for a clanless kunoichi to live, and it's not that uncommon to find yourself in a victim's bed during a mission, just to stab someone to death after or during a shaboink. And getting important information through the bed? That's not an uncommon mission either. In addition, many visiting aristocrats do not mind getting deadly and slender kunoichi in their bed, so they do not consider it a shame to earn money in this way. And if you refuse such tasks then there are only low-paying missions like courier or with a high chance of meeting the enemy, where it is much easier for a woman to die than a man. So it's better to jump on a handsome young boy and get a second chance than to end up in some old bastard's bed. Those are my words, but her own. From such revelations, some hovered for a bit, digesting the new information. I waited patiently for her reaction. It doesn't seem right, she sighed, raising her gaze to me. Such rules fit the world we live in. I shrugged and soothingly patted her back. Though, the situation is noticeably improving now. Why is that? Inazuka raised an eyebrow. Because now even non-clan Kunoichi are finally receiving such solid training at the academy that even those not too strong can live decently from earnings of combat missions. So, only those who see nothing shameful in it will take on honeypot missions giving others a broader choice. At least it's not like during the clan wars when a leader could summon any subordinate and simply order them to seduce someone or even bear a child from a strong enemy warrior. Refusal in such tasks was not even considered. Of course, such things can still happen today, as you can imagine from attempts to catch my attention at the academy. But these days a girl has the option to say no and at worst become simply clanless. I didn't mention the Hugo with their hideous seal of slavery, but the overall idea didn't change. With the creation of hidden villages, Chakra users from clans gained more personal freedom and opportunities than during the times of clans, when everything was subject to strict hierarchy. Anyway, we've deviated a bit from the topic. Even during long missions, it's not uncommon for partners to end up in bed with each other out of mutual sympathy. The body still demands its due. And even such a minor factor as excessive irritability can lead to fatal consequences for the team. Do you really think that isn't taken into account when forming teams? At least one kunoichi, but there's always a part of all newly formed gen and trios. Even if sometimes it's a sensei. The same logic guides the selection of teams for specific missions important for the village. Often, in a male company, Kunoichi play the role of a kind of buffer between partners with dissimilar characters. The chances of killing each other in an all-male company in case of any friction are much higher than when there is at least one member of the opposite sex present. Wow, there you have it. And here you are getting all worked up over just one instance. I chuckled, pleased with the impression I made. So, as long as you remember that we are clan members with all the ensuing consequences, I'm quite willing to spend some nights in your company. Having enjoyed watching some blush and look away, I sighed and lifted her off my knees. And now that we've discussed everything, it's time for you to go find Kuru. Poor dog hasn't been fed since yesterday and hasn't shown up at my tent just because he understands the necessity of your rest. 
Right, Kuromaru? The girl immediately panicked. I completely forgot about him. Jumping to her feet, she rushed towards the exit. But right at the threshold, she paused and turned back, sending me a dazzling, toothy smile. Thank you. With that, she slipped out of the tent. Well, that problem is sorted out. Now it's time to simply relax. I've already forgotten when I could just lie down and nap without a care in the world. Tomorrow will bring a new day full of worries and anxieties. But for today, I rest. After all, I also have the lazy genes of the Nara clan in me. Uzumaki Mito strolled leisurely and with dignity through the Senju Quarter, following a route she had become well acquainted with over the past two weeks. Responding to the respectful greetings of her late husband's clanmates, once an Uzumaki, always an Uzumaki, the powerful Kunoichi restrained her irritation at such a slow mode of movement, simply because it wasn't fitting for a woman of her status to jump rooftops like a juvenile. Ever since gaining her second youth, however, Mito wanted to move and feel the workings of her renewed body. Before Ryo left for the front lines, her pent-up energy had been released in battles and in bed. Now, all that was left for Uzumaki was to be patient, to conduct the occasional training with Kushina, who had recently received her Yuzushuvi Kyur Jinin symbol from Mito's hands, and to practice meditation in hopes of Ryo's swift return. Recently, however, she had taken on another activity that consumed a considerable amount of her free time, visiting a young mother who had only recently been freed from the burden of pregnancy just a couple of weeks ago. That was exactly where she was headed. Carefully stepping over the protective perimeter of the security barrier she had erected at the first signs of Lin Li's rounded belly, Mito ascended the porch and rang the bell located to the left of the door, announcing her presence. Without waiting for a response, she entered the house. Although the entire Senju quarter was surrounded by protective and alarm barriers preventing anyone from entering the secured territory without overcoming guarded gates, over her long life as a kunoichi, Mito had learned one lesson. It was always necessary to remain vigilant and take security measures even under conditions of complete safety. Considering the identity of the child's father, it was necessary to take appropriate precautions regardless of circumstances. Lin Chan, I'm here, Uzumaki called out, removing her shoes in the hallway and stepping with pristine white socks onto the polished wooden floor. I'm in the nursery, Mito sama Lin Li's voice immediately replied. Confidently navigating through the familiar house, Mito joined her young friend just as she was breastfeeding the rosy-cheeked baby girl. Despite her recent birth, little Katsumi already displayed true traits of red-haired Fuinjetsu masters, an excellent appetite at any time of day or night, and a rich red hue to her thin hair that had only started to emerge a few days earlier. How's our little treasure doing? The formidable Kunoichi beamed broadly shedding the impassive mask of a porcelain doll she wore in public. She eats so much her ears must be ringing. The redhead Senju smiled lovingly at her child. No surprises there. Takes after her dad. Mito smirked, affectionately watching the baby suckling eagerly. However, this moment didn't last long as she once again assumed a focused expression. I found a solution to our little problem. And how reliable is it? It can only be detected by those who know what to look for and have a good knowledge of Fuinjutsu, Mito informed. The seal will change the hair color to an exact copy of yours, and only over time will it shift towards its natural shade. By 15 years old, Katsumi will have her own natural color. But by then, anyone interested will be convinced that her hair simply darkened over time, as often happens with most children. The issue with little Senju Uzumaki had arisen relatively recently. Since Lin Li had sufficient finances not only for years of life ahead, but also investments in clan enterprises. Contrary to carefully maintained public opinion, the founding clans owned not only all the hot springs of Kanahigakure and Sato, but also about one-fifth of the village's immovable property, rented out in most cases. The retired Kunoichi could afford the services of a skilled midwife in the final month of pregnancy rather than checking into the maternity wards like most other women nearing their due dates. Thus, only a limited number of people had seen the newborn baby girl, and only the mother and the named Godmother Mito had seen her hair begin to grow. Therefore, after a brief discussion, it was decided to simplify Ryo's life 
and changed the color of the girl's hair to something closer to her mother's before presenting her to the clan. Plus, avoiding a scandal with the Nara clan regarding paternity was an additional bonus. Indeed, while there were villagers with similar hair colors due to the great affection shown by the allies of the Uzumaki clan, they were all from ordinary women. Unlike Ryo, who was a very purebred representative from the allied clans on both sides of his family. The results of years of selection are never in vain, and children from such shinobi heads with clan elders prefer to keep them close. In Kanoha, there were currently only two recognized representatives of the Uzumaki clan, Mido and Ryo. Unfortunately, Kushina did not belong to this list despite her pure lineage. Jinshuriki are primarily considered strategic assets, and then everything else. All others, even promising half-bloods among the master's students, left the village by the order of the Hokage. The appearance of a third could cause unnecessary excitement among the clans and a new twist of intrigue for the opportunity to gain strong blood through marriage, as they had been attempting to do with Nerozamaki until now. There were no doubts in Mido's mind that Katsumi would grow up to be a strong Kunoichi. Even now, the little girl possessed more chakra reserves than her Senja peers. Considering the clear advantages of Uzumaki blood, not only the Hyuga and Uchiha clans would strive to recruit her into their ranks. Therefore, by concealing the name of the baby's genius father, the Kunoichi hoped to greatly reduce unwanted attention towards another Senju, albeit slightly stronger than her peers. In the Shinobi world, Unnecessary fame mostly increases the number of hunters after your head and does not contribute to a long life. Mido had reaffirmed this recently, during the attempted kidnapping of little Kushina by the cloud. The idiots had not considered her training and the small secrets authored by Ryo. Thirty golden chains and the power of the raising Gan proved enough to turn the attackers into unrecognizable piles of meat even before Mido arrived in response to the distress seal specially embedded in the Jinshuriki seal. Danzo and Hiruzen trembled for a week over the brainwashing inflicted on them by the wife of the first Hokage. In that case, while the little one is occupied, we can proceed, leanly nodded in agreement. Oh ho ho, don't worry my dear, for a master of my level, this will only take a second or two, the ancient Kunoichi laughed with arrogant superiority. Extending her hand, she touched the tip of her index finger to the baby girl's crown, causing dark blue symbols to scatter in all directions from that spot. After a couple of moments, they literally sank into the skin of her head and disappeared from view, while her sparse hair changed to a bright red color. And that's it. In a few months, it'll be impossible to find anything under her hair. Even with the utmost desire, Mido-sama said. Thank you, Mido-sama. Leanly inclined her head, carefully removing the drowsy daughter from her breast during feeding and placing her in the crib. Don't mention it, Lin-chan. It cost me nothing, and the girl will have a quieter life among her peers. Uzumaki waved her hand, taking the young friend by the elbow and heading to the living room. There, the clone of the hostess had just finished setting up a tray with tea and a small vase of cookies on a small table in front of the sofa. Comfortably settling down, the women acknowledged the elite strain cultivated by the clan, after which they continued their conversation. How is Kushinachan doing? After everything that happened, Linley left the sentence unfinished, but it was clear what she meant. To be honest, after the attempted kidnapping, Kushina hardly changed and certainly didn't lose her desire to be a Kunoichi. Mido shook her head, smiling faintly. It wasn't worth one of those idiots calling her a tomato. The last failures who tried that spent over a month in the hospital three years ago. Senja couldn't help but laugh, knowing the village gossip from that time. Because of her fiery temperament, Kushinachan barely remembers how she turned two Jounin and three Chunin into a bloody mess. I even had to drag her away from the corpses to allow the arriving ANBU to conduct identification. The redhead beauty snorted. Thanks to her explosive character, she had no doubt about the necessity of killing the next idiots, especially those not from our village. Yeah, most Jinnin worry about their first kill, the redhead sighed, clearly reminiscing about her childhood. What does she worry about? She hasn't even had a single nightmare about it. Anyone who dared to mock her beautiful hair and face must die, and I have no doubt about it. Mito sighed sorrowfully and added grimly, I blame Ryo for this. 
Rio? The homeowner widened her eyes in surprise. What does he have to do with this? What does he have to do with it? He's been brainwashing her about this since childhood. At first, I took it all as a joke and even indulged it, but by the end of the academy, it had turned into a guide to action, and it was too late to do anything. May the Shinigami of the souls of the uninitiated be at peace. Senjin nodded in agreement. If she's already capable of handling two Jounin now, what will it be like in a few years? By the way, it's also Ryo's fault. He taught her the raisin gan and the chains, the guest remarked casually, sipping aromatic tea and nibbling on cookies. Speaking of Ryo, Lin Li hesitated for a moment, throwing a quick glance at her companion, but continued nonetheless, Why did you still allow him to be the father of my child despite your relationship? Because you deserved your piece of happiness after a not-so-happy life, even by shinobi standards. Mito replied after a brief silence. And despite Ryo firmly establishing himself in my bed before heading to the front, there's no love between us in the conventional sense. Yes, we like each other, both in conversation and physically. Strangely enough, the boy is very level-headed and thoughtful. Sometimes I even think he's my peer. So... Our relationship is mainly physical, not romantic, and I know for a fact that Ryu had another partner besides me. But, believe me, for a young and active Uzumaki, three lovers are not the limit. I know that much. So, ultimately, it was his decision, and I merely nudged Ryu towards a positive answer, guided by my own considerations. After all, in war, anything can happen, and even Uzumaki can die from numerous wounds despite all our resilience. It would be very disappointing if such a talented young man were to perish without leaving any legacy behind except for a few techniques. We live in dangerous times, dear, and no one can guarantee that tomorrow won't be the last. While I somewhat ensured Kushina's safety by pushing her towards Hitaki Sakomo as her teacher, Ryo is beyond my reach, so at least let there be a daughter after him, should the worst happen. Aren't you even a bit jealous? Lin Li cautiously inquired, digesting the reasons voiced by the guest. Jealousy? I'm too old to engage in such foolishness. Mito chuckled. Or, do you think Hashirama never strayed? I'll tell you a little secret I've learned over the years of married life. There are no absolutely faithful men. No matter how much they love us, men always have wandering eyes for other women and will try to lift more than one skirt even with a beautiful wife at home. It's in men's nature to acquire as many partners as possible. The question is where they return after their escapades. And even Hashira Masama? Alas, Hashikuen was far from as perfect as he's now preferred to be portrayed. The guest shook her head. However, that's ancient history, I'll tell another time. I'm afraid it's time for me to return home. Kushina should be back from training soon. Thank you for your help, Mito-sama. Senju immediately got up and bowed. It was no trouble at all for me, Lin Li. The redhead beauty waved dismissively, also rising from the sofa. I may not have time to visit you tomorrow, but I'll drop by in a day for sure. I'll wait, Mito-sama. The hostess smiled, seeing the guest off to the door. And don't worry, I'll send Ryo a message through the summons, so he'll find out about our daughter very soon and without interception. Uzumaki added before leaving the house. Maybe that will make him behave more cautiously and hold on until he's sent home. We can only hope and pray to the gods, Senju agreed. Sighing, I cracked my neck and stretched my upper body, trying to loosen muscles that had stiffened from long hours of sitting. What can you do? There are no comfortable chairs in the field hospital to spend the night in, and all the beds are occupied after yesterday's return from a deep raid behind enemy lines in the earth country. So, I have to make do with roughly assembled stools, the work of local craftsmen who manage kanai and shuriken. And I can't afford to not stay alert. Three of the severely injured barely held on even after surgery, so I have to check on them literally every hour for complications. The shortage of medicines exacerbates everything. Old supplies are melting away before our eyes, and new deliveries are rare and in small quantities. Chakra is important. But the timely application of medicines should not be underestimated. With such blood loss, pills alone won't do, especially when the patient's body is already on the verge of exhaustion by all parameters. 
I've pressed the commander constantly upon hearing about the request for a new supply convoy with everything necessary from the main camp. And even then, I'd only get crumbs at best, which we have to economize and use in critical situations. What am I saying? Even the bandage kits for herbal compresses have to be brought in from Kizagakir through acquaintances with Jaunin. Thankfully, it's only a three-hour trip one way from our location, and they gladly accept seals as barter. Yeah, it's come to this, having to stock up on our own when the village should provide everything. Ikisan blushed, paled, but didn't object to my frustration with the situation. After all, it's the commander's duty to provide his fighters with everything necessary. So, I have to sacrifice sleep to ensure that none of the heavies who arrive die in my absence. Of course, I could have left Uchiha, but the girl was so exhausted during the day that she literally fell asleep on the go. I didn't have the heart to burden her with watch duty on top of that. So, I had to manage it myself. In principle, I'm capable of staying awake for three days without any harm to myself. All it takes is some light brain stimulation with medical chakra to avoid yawning every five minutes. But it gives me a chance to think in peace and quiet. Soothing the wounded has become a habit, so they don't suffer from pain, get proper rest, and I don't get distracted by every moan. And what was I thinking about? While I haven't participated as much in the forays from the camp as my teammates from the squad, over time, I've accumulated a decent amount of combat experience, both as a lone unit and with the support of several teams on raids into enemy territory. And recently, I've started to feel a sense of wrongness around. However, the reason turned out to be extremely simple and banal. The Shinobi and Kunoichi surrounding me are overwhelmingly lazy and blockheads. No, I'm not calling them idiots, because not a few specimens from the majority are quite capable of using their brains. They just don't do it as often or as well as they could. Unlike the Irionin who read a huge number of books and constantly improve themselves not only through experience and training, but also through absorbing new knowledge, the average shinobi over their short life might read only a dozen or so books, and those are mostly about combat or different techniques. In other words, the knowledge acquired in the academy remains basic. Only combat experience is perfected. So it's not surprising that a very large part of chakra users simply don't get used to thinking about something for a sufficient amount of time. Hence the somewhat poor options for tactics, the inclination to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy even in unfavorable battle scenarios, instead of retreating and trying a different approach. No tricky maneuvers, no elaborate multi-step traps, just what a smart person without formal education could come up with. That's why Nara are considered geniuses. Our tactical preparation is three heads above anything taught in Shinobi Academies. And our predisposition to use our brains instead of loafing around like everyone else. It's indulging in our own laziness, so to speak. Despite the so-called principles of teamwork that every sensei drills into Genin, each Chunin has barely a dozen or so tactical schemes, depending on observed enemy characteristics. I have about 300 for different team compositions, the characteristics of their members, the specifics of Clan Keki Ijenkai with hidden jutsu, various types of tasks, ultimate goals, and similar nuances. What can I say? A five-year-old from our world knows more than healthy 30-year-old uncles from here. Aside from their reluctance to use their brains, all shinobi preach a cult of strength, and simply acknowledging their superiority over ordinary people greatly defies common sense. I suspect that it's not just the influence of chakra that's at fault here. In many cases, it's the arrogance that comes from power that recklessly dismisses caution, combined with the youthfulness of users. From my observations, 70% of those in combat are between 15 and 20 years old, with all the resulting consequences. Hormones, adrenaline, and chakra, with brains washed by the will of fire. This deadly cocktail creates suicide fighters ready to tear through the enemy until victory. What tactical maneuvers? Just hit harder with Jutsu, and the problem is solved. These are real child soldiers, and yet such behavior is considered normal. Moreover, this situation is observed not only here, but also in a Wagakure, which is forced to send more inexperienced fighters into battle. Soon we'll have to send completely green genin to their deaths right after they finish their training. The first signs are already visible. So, I stopped being surprised by the sick trying to escape as soon as they can stand up, disregarding their own health, 
By neglecting existing wounds just to avoid falling into the hands of medical ninjas, attempts at self-healing, detached fingers and hands from trying to use enemy jutsu, remembered from the last battle. Cases of being blown up by their own traps or protective belts around the camp, as well as alcohol and drug intoxications of idiots who managed to sneak in during stress and relaxation, not understanding anything at all. And I haven't even mentioned the wonderful habit of chatting with the enemy during battle, which has firmly established itself in the traditions of local shinobi of almost any age. No, I understand that it takes time to ramp up the source and send more chakra through the chakra pathways to use more powerful techniques, but not at the expense of common sense. When there's a chance to quickly finish off the enemy instead of giving them a chance to play a trump card, this doesn't even touch on the ability to ignore orders unintentional sabotage, because the performer thought another option was cooler, and similar cases where subordinates are unhappy with the commander's actions, even if they are actually correct, but the commander doesn't enjoy much respect from those he commands. After all, it's not for nothing that only those who are suitable for command positions by strength, not by ability to command, receive ranks. Such an unpopular commander might face several challenges from disgruntled individuals upon returning to the village if he turns out to be weaker than his fighters. Hence the consequences of the cult of strength. Yeah, and the Hokage becomes the strongest, able to shut up all other aspiring ones. Perhaps the only exceptions to this are the Nara, solely due to their established reputation as brilliant strategists. It's not shameful to listen to them even in the heat of battle. Yes, reputation plays a significant role in this world. You can take me as an example. Despite a solid reputation as an excellent medical ninja, a master of fuinjutsu, and a decent fighter, among those who haven't been in my hands yet, there's often a disdainful expression for a rear rat incapable of getting to the front lines without sitting behind others. It's just that during the recent raid, when I managed to not only save the wounded, but also eliminate five times more enemies in less than ideal condition. It seemed like everyone had suddenly changed their tune, and even yesterday's detractors were now nodding respectfully. This damn ninja world with its quirks, which seem absurd to any rational person not raised in such an environment, is just normal here. By the way, the implied meaning of the word shinobi is different here than in the previous world. A person who can use jutsu with chakra, whereas a samurai is a chakra user who uses it for sword fighting. Something like that. However, that's the reality of the surroundings. It's just that the depressive indifference I had been experiencing more frequently lately has lately evaporated under the onslaught of the joy and satisfaction bursting from my chest. And the cause of this is a small note I received recently from an irate cat and destroyed almost immediately after reading the content of which can be summed up in just four words. I had a daughter. Luckily, I was in my tent at that moment. Otherwise, a wild cry of joy might have alarmed the entire camp and raised a lot of uncomfortable questions from those around me. In fact, just the thought of it was enough to keep my mood consistently high, with a happy smile, while hidden behind my mask, never leaving my face. It was slightly overshadowed by the fact that I wasn't able to be present at her birth, but there was nothing to be done about that. All that remains is to wait for the moment when we are sent back to Kanoa for a rest, but that's still at least a month away, as the standard shift is 10 to 12 months of war followed by a couple of months of rest. 10 months have already passed, and there are no signs of it yet. I imagine holding the red-haired baby in my arms, and sighed happily. It's just a pity that her name was chosen without my involvement. Katsumi sounds good too, but I would have liked to personally participate in choosing the name. However, I'm not planning to stop at just one, so there's still plenty ahead. I'm not sure if they will have just one mother, but I'll try to increase the number of my offspring to at least two before the second decade. That way, I'll be sure that something will remain after me, besides a few personal jutsu, and those stolen from others who haven't created anything similar themselves, rather than ones developed by my own efforts. A moan from a wounded man interrupted my thoughts, and I jumped from my chair. I almost missed the check time, having been so deep in thought, and rushed to the most critical patients, activating my mystical hand and starting to check two shinobi who were next to each other. After confirming their condition, it was the turn of the third patient, where I got stuck. The severe chakra exhaustion had taken its toll, and now the young Inazuka's body 
was in a borderline state, needing constant stimulation of the internal organs to ensure their somewhat stable functioning until his own chakra production started to strengthen the areas I had healed. And four with some useful solutions would have been ideal for such cases, but what's not there isn't there. Finishing the preventative procedures, I returned to my place. It was fortunate that most of the injuries our shinobi sustained were from jutsu used. As an Irionin, I absolutely loved Dotan and Suedan for their almost complete lack of damaged chakra channels in the body. These two elements are inherently protective and almost do not affect the bodies of those subjected to their techniques. Unlike Ketan, Raitan, and Futon, which not only maim the body, but also simultaneously damage the chakra system. The same goes for various Jinjutsu that combine aggressive elements. For example, the lava that passed over my back not only damaged some minor chakra channels, but also temporarily worsened the functioning of the Tenketsu in the affected area. Although I managed to restore everything without much trouble, a regular shinobi is not capable of this. Nor is most Irionin even of the third rank. Damage to the Kirikuki eye means the end of a shinobi's career and a life of poverty on disability benefits if another job cannot be found. Unfortunately, it is more profitable for the village to train new recruits than to rehabilitate the injured with a limited number of qualified hospital staff. Come in and make yourself comfortable, Danzo. Saratobi nodded to his old comrade and friend. This time, he was hosting the head of Root not in the office at the top of the tower, but on his clan's grounds, where one could be sure that no outsiders could overhear a conversation on topics sensitive to other clans. The special room, equipped specifically for important negotiations, ensured that not a sound would escape through its thin walls. After all, excessive caution has never harmed anyone. I'm surprised you took so long to arrange a personal meeting, Hiruzen. Shimura grunted and took the chair opposite the host at a small coffee table set for two. You know it's better to let the dust settle first, and then make other plans. The Hokage shook his head. After all, you don't really believe that Mido-sama is so foolish as to actually believe the official version of the Kimobi cure, Shinobi infiltrating Kanoha. Do you? Both powerful Shinobi shuddered in unison, recalling the wrath of the first Hokage's wife, who was very displeased with the attack on her ward, almost in the center of what was supposed to be a protected village. It was thanks to this that she managed to push through the appointment of the trusted mentor, Jinchuriki Hitaki Sakamo, who was quite happy about the chance to spend more time with his family in the village, dismissing the offered ANBU protection. Unfortunately, it was the failure of the invisible guards that allowed Uzumaki to do this so easily, playing on the village council's fears of losing such an advantage over other countries. Even if they had weaker bijou, but besides Suna and Taki, winning in number of vessels. Unfortunately, a long-prepared and highly risky operation was ruined by a simple underestimation of the target. You're right, the failure of the operation has set us back considerably. Danzo nodded. And as a result, Sakomo was unavailable to me for quite some time. None of those present in the room needed to be reminded that the founding clans would be monitoring such a team even more closely in the future. Unfortunately, Hiruzen had been unable to fend off the placement of the Jinchuriki heir to the Uchiha team. We must admit that the idea of presenting Minato as the savior for the kidnapped Jinchuriki turned out to be a failure. Saratobi reached for his pipe, recalling the report from his subordinates about the small Kunoichi's massacre. However, this is just a temporary setback. How is the recruitment of Namikaze progressing? As expected, the initial materials provided on Fuinjutsu have significantly eased the task, as has the promise to place him under Jiraiya's tutelage as soon as he returns to the village. The head of Root replied with satisfaction. And the boy's dream of becoming Hokage helps increase the leverage we have over him. Not to mention the possibility of gaining access to Mido's library through Kushina in the not-so-distant future. Haruzen noted, puffing out clouds of tobacco smoke after a deep drag. Given my hint about Kushina's importance to the village and the increased chance of getting to the Hokage seat with such a wife, it's just a matter of time. The one-eyed shinobi smirked faintly, carefully sipping hot tea from a decorated porcelain cup. We were fortunate that the vessel suited him well without our manipulations. Rather, it was Minato's interest in the art of seals, where Uzumaki are recognized as the masters, that had an impact, 
Saratobi observed. The young orphan turned out to be unexpectedly reasonable and easily made contact once some of the advantages of cooperation and benefits for Kanoha were mentioned. Of course, such favoritism from the Hokage would inevitably raise questions among the clans. But Danzo managed his role as a temporary intermediary well, while also assessing the boy's loyalty to the village. Perhaps at the next meeting, hint to Minato about the possibility of additional training under your subordinates in addition to the training he receives from his team sensei, Saratobi decided. The boy should be encouraged for his diligence. What about granting him access to the Hokage's library in exchange for the obtained Fuinjutsu scrolls? Shimura asked. It's too early. He's still just a good acquaintance, perhaps a friend with a passion for Fuinjutsu. His interlocutor shook his head. Mito-sama might suspect something, and then we would have to find another approach in a more complicated situation. For a while, both Shinobi fell silent, contemplating their next steps in the quiet. After enjoying his pipe and tapping the ash into a special dish, Hiruzen changed the subject. By the way, how is the training of our few Injutsu producers progressing? I've been receiving reports again about a shortage of quality seals not only from ANBU but also from our main forces in recent months. The progress is not very good. Out of nearly 20, half have either died or been injured in ways that prevent them from continuing to work on Fuinjutsu. Danzo shook his head. Studying seals from scrolls is only useful at the very beginning and in the simplest cases, like the Kibo Fuda, but when it comes to more complex seals, problems arise. Our people need a teacher who can demonstrate the mistakes made in practice and without losing limbs when the seals malfunction. And as for the shortage of quality seals, you yourself sent the owner of the only shop where they were sold to the front. The owner? Who is that? Saratobi frowned, trying to recall potential candidates. However, there were only a few candidates, and none fit except Hashirama's wife. But that option was immediately dismissed. The Hokage had heard about the new shop, but hadn't bothered to find out about the supplier. There were more urgent matters at the time. Ryo Nara. The head of Roots snorted in irritation. You couldn't have missed him, as the four of us discussed him more than once. Nara? But he's an Irionin. What does Fuinjutsu have to do with it? Hiruzen. The commander should have given you a report on all the teams whose time had come to go to the front, not to mention the immediate surroundings of the Jinchuriki. At that moment, Saratobi remembered indeed having seen such a report, but having skimmed through it, he hadn't read it in detail just noting that such a promising shinobi should be removed. Obviously, he hadn't reached the part describing Nara's abilities in Fuinjutsu. However, it was unlikely to have influenced the decision to send such a talented and promising shinobi to the front and as far away from the Bijou vessel as possible, with a slim hope for a fatal outcome. Well, there's nothing to be done about it now, the Hokage shrugged. There's barely half a year left in the war, and the shortage of good seals won't have much impact on that. We'll have to use what we have. You better tell me, what about Orochimaru? He recently sent a note through one of my people, saying he's ready to start executing the plan, Shimura reported. I'll handle the backup and the enemies, so you just need to give the go-ahead for the operation. Then a month from now will be the right time, Saratobi nodded. The death of Hashirama's grandson, although necessary to maintain full control, weighed heavily on the conscience of the aging shinobi who had initiated it. However, the benefits of this act far outweighed the resulting pangs of guilt. Uzumaki Mito and Senjitoka had been becoming increasingly active lately, gradually gaining more influence, and Tsunade had gone completely out of control. They all needed to be reminded of whom the true ruler of the village was. Nawaki's death would serve this purpose perfectly and might even lead to the removal of the Senju clan head from the political front. After all, her age made her too frail for severe emotional shocks. She might not die, but her health could deteriorate significantly. Before rejuvenating himself and regaining his full strength, it would have been possible to eliminate Mito in the same manner. But at the moment, even Hiruzen wouldn't dare to confront her on equal terms. News of the grandson's death would hardly bring her down. In any case, the three powerful Kunoichi would be subdued, allowing the Hokage to focus on the political maneuverings with the founders for a while. Of course, it might be worth trying to gain the support of the Uchiha as a counterbalance to the Senju, 
But the Red Eye clan was too engrossed in the ongoing war to be distracted by anything else, and relations with them were already strained due to Tobarama's restraining policies, which Hiruzen fully supported. Hiruzen was interrupted from his thoughts by a small scroll tossed to him by Danzo. What's this? The experienced shinobi caught it easily and looked questioningly at his guest. The cost of dealing with the Senju, explained the head of Root. Or did you think Orochimaru would put himself at such risk for nothing? Of course, Hiruzen had expected something like this from his most favored student, well aware of the research tendencies of the snake Sanin, which required substantial funding. However, providing a well-equipped laboratory, several dozen test subjects, and a large list of various substances and medicines, both medical and otherwise, would be a significant strain on Kanoha's budget. This meant that funding for the Irionine program would once again have to be deferred, despite the unpopularity of such a decision among the clans and ordinary shinobi. Fine, I'll send Orochimaru the summons, so you'll be responsible for providing the operation with personnel and a capable coordinator. You will report the results to me personally. The Hokage gave the one-eyed shinobi a stern look. And make sure that no one suspects that the village was involved in the death of Hashirama's grandson rather than enemies who chose the timing well. All involved will not survive a day. Danzo confirmed with a nod, showing no sign of discomfort at the thought of his subordinates' deaths. However, with all the recent events, it will take me a long time to recover the losses. Don't worry, after the war ends, you can start recruiting for your route again, Hiruzen reassured him. He forgot to mention that all orphans from the shelters would first go to the Shinobi Academy to replenish the village's losses, and only unsuitable or overloaded individuals would be sent to the 2nd AMBU unit, significantly weakening the potential of the entire organization and sparing the Hokage from excessive headaches from such a problematic ally, who still looked greedily at the Kinoha ruler's throne. In that case, I won't waste any more of our time. Until we meet again, Hiruzen. The head of Root gave a brief nod and quickly left the room. Enjoying the sizzling meat, and almost ignoring the envious glances from all around, I indulged in the kebab I had prepared myself, which tasted worlds apart from those awful dry rations like night and day. Recently, good food in the camp had become scarce. The local game, whatever there was in such a rocky area, had been mostly wiped out by the residents themselves, and buying from Kuzagakir had become painfully expensive. Unfortunately, the grass village was too small to continuously supply food for over 200 shinobi in addition to its own residents, who eat much more than an ordinary person. This meant that merchants had to inflate prices substantially, and not every frontline soldier could afford 100 ryo for lunch. So, we had to make do, carefully tracking the surrounding area during patrols. Maybe we'd managed to catch something. This time, we were lucky enough to bring down a rather large mountain goat. So about 70 kilograms of pure, though unfortunately a bit smelly, meat would be very welcome for the next week. The unpleasant odor was effectively masked with its some herbs we found. After finishing a piece of meat skewered on a clean sinbon, without any skewers, we had to improvise. I licked the grease from my fingers and contentedly leaned back on the stone seat I had set up near the fire. It might be rough, but it was more comfortable than the various stumps that other shinobi used, who didn't have even the most basic proficiency in doton. So, shall we cook up another batch? I asked my companions. No, that's enough for today. This was already the fifth serving. Inazuka, sitting nearby, waved lazily. At this rate, we'll eat all the meat in a couple of days, and then we'll have to go back to those rations. Better to stretch out the enjoyment, Rotaro nodded in agreement. Who knows when luck will smile upon us again, and we'll catch something. Alright if that's enough. I shrugged and sealed the remaining cooked meat along with the bowl into a food scroll. A few chunin who had been loitering nearby, attracted by the delicious smell, sighed with envy and began to disperse. Naive, did they really think they'd get something? No, in the matter of foraging and consuming food, everyone is on their own. After the past few months, the awful taste of rations had become so unbearable that it made me want to vomit. I even had to shut off the taste receptors in my mouth to eat the double portion needed to maintain my muscle mass, which is a bit larger than that of an ordinary shinobi. However, our trio didn't get to enjoy the blissful peace and full stomachs for long. A shinobi appeared who served as a courier for the higher-ups. Nara-san 
The commander requests your presence. Surprised, I got up and ran after the messenger, giving my companions a reassuring nod. I wondered what was so urgent that Mido needed me for. We had seen each other recently and could have resolved any issues then. We reached the main building in mere seconds and, without bothering with announcements, went inside. As per your orders, Rio Narsen has arrived, reported the messenger to the shinobi sitting at the desk surrounded by papers. Excellent. Iki looked up, waved him off, and turned his attention to me. Have a seat, Rio-san. I'll finish up here, and then we'll discuss the reason for your summons. Shrugging, I moved a free chair away from the table and sat down. I could wait, even though I was eager to find out everything quickly. A few minutes wouldn't make much difference. However, it didn't take long to wait. The commander read through a few more sheets of reports, signed them, then rolled them up and placed them in a small stack of already reviewed scrolls, which he had sealed with wax and a few injutsu seal, usually used for stamps, but adapted by the Uzumaki genius for this purpose, which could only be broken with a matching seal at the main headquarters, where this pile of paperwork would eventually be sent. Even though we are an assassination organization, bureaucracy still causes considerable problems here, albeit not as much as at the daimyo's court. So, let's get to the point. Your team's skills are needed for a small but crucial capture mission. The commander began, tiredly rubbing his eyes. Just tonight, our specialists managed to crack one of the prisoners and learn the likely route along which orders from Awabikiro no Sato are delivered to the front lines. And how does this concern us? I raised an eyebrow in question, especially considering the fact that we just returned from a patrol last night. How does it concern you? It's simple. We need not only to capture the orders being delivered, but also to capture the courier intact, or at least alive, and able to answer questions. And since you are the only operational Nara and the most experienced Irionin we have, there's no one else we can send. Wincing, I remembered that I had sent the last fellow clan member to the main camp with a convoy of the wounded just last week. The unfortunate Tawa had suffered such severe chakra exhaustion on his last patrol that he would recover at best in a month, if not longer. And why is it necessary to take him alive? I was still hoping to wriggle out of the honor of a deep raid in an enemy territory and grasped at any straw. A mere courier doesn't know much, and the orders are far more important than the contents of his head. Perhaps, but couriers are not randomly chosen. They are specifically selected shinobi who are regularly involved in this task. Mido shook his head. This will allow Yamanaka to extract from his memory all the routes ever used by IWA for delivering important documentation, which will allow us to disrupt these well-established lines of order delivery to the front. I sighed, realizing I could no longer avoid the task, thereby causing confusion in the enemy's ranks and allowing our forces to take advantage of the moment for another offensive. Exactly. So be here tomorrow by 10 with your team to discuss the details of the mission and meet with your commander and censor, who will be one and the same. Understood. I'll be there. I nodded to the commander and stood up. After leaving the large room, lit only by a couple of oil lamps, few injutsu lights for the front are too expensive, especially in these times when the Uzumaki shop is no longer available. On Mido's table, I noticed the clouds starting to gather which had become frequent guests this time of year, and headed towards my tent, where we had set up the campfire. So, what's the news? Ishii asked lazily, picking at his teeth with a sharp bone, as soon as I plopped down at my spot. Some also stopped grooming the contented Kuramaru and raised an inquisitive eyebrow. Nothing good. Another mission tomorrow, I replied. A raid in enemy territory to capture a courier carrying orders from IWA. But we just got back. What about the rest we're supposed to have? Rotaro immediately protested. Rest is just a dream for us. I grunted in response. Our team is the only one well-suited not only for battles but also for capturing live targets. So there's no avoiding the mission. And be thankful we'll be assigned a censor to the team. They could have sent us without one. Despite the years spent in the team, I still hadn't revealed my own gift to anyone preferring to keep it as a trump card for unforeseen situations. Yeah, as if that's going to make our task any easier. Some scoffed, picking up her comb again. In any case, it will increase our chances of returning intact. I disagreed with her. Be here tomorrow at 10 in the morning, so keep that in mind. What a mess! 
Can't even get a decent rest. My partner groaned, spitting out a bone and getting to his feet. I'm off to mow me and don't bother me until tomorrow. After watching the grumbling guy walk off, I turned at some and her dog. I don't know about you, but I'm going to start preparing and making the seals that we'll definitely need soon. Do you need anything? Perhaps a dozen explosive and blinding ones, since I have less than ten left. The Kunoichi nodded without stopping her grooming. Or I'll take care of it. Retreating to my tent, I started rummaging through my things, searching for a specific scroll with the remaining few injets of paper that my mother had sent at the beginning of the month along with her letter. Although I had used most of it for making simple seals for sale at the idol shop, there was still enough chakra conducting paper for current needs. After finally unearthing the sought-after scroll from under a pile of dirty patrol clothes, I unrolled a dozen large sheets, tossed them on the table, and began mixing fresh ink, generously adding my blood to it and infusing it with chakra. So, I need about 20 explosive ones, some blinding, paralyzing, and chakra-blocking seals for the prisoner or prisoners, then at least one set of barrier seals and another set of barrier camouflage seals just in case in case Rotaro's concealment illusions turn out to be less effective against the courier. Setting aside the necessary six sheets, I resealed the rest back into the scroll and picked up my brush to start the work. Gone were the days when I had to spend hours on each seal, using a bunch of clones for the task. With the experience and skills gained as a good user of few Fuinjutsu under Maidakan's mentorship, I could now mass-produce even fairly complex seals on a single sheet with minimal effort. Covering an entire sheet with a large few injets of seal took no more than an hour, after which I gently blew on the ink, ensuring it had dried properly after being absorbed into the paper. I then placed my hand in the center of the seal and began infusing it with chakra. Once the required amount was filled, the seal glowed blue and started changing gradually. Removing my hand, I once again watched, mesmerized, as the fantastic spectacle of changes on the paper unfolded. After half a minute, the transformations of the characters, their overlapping, merging, and the emergence of new patterns revealed a sheet with 20 kibikofuda, which only needed to be separated. This was also anticipated by running my palm, enveloped in green chakra. Over the sheet, I separated the seals effortlessly. I stacked them and tied them with a prepared string, then put the stack in my cloak pocket and reached for the next sheet. Even though the production process had significantly sped up without compromising quality, I eagerly awaited the day when I would learn to produce any seals with just a touch on any surface, like all Uzumaki who chose to specialize in Fuinjutsu. Thanks to the density of our chakra, almost all clan members can manipulate it much better than other shinobi, as clearly demonstrated by the chakra chains we create, which even the strongest biju cannot always break. Of course, even the puppeteers from Suna use chakra threads to control their constructs in a similar manner, but they can't wrap someone in a cocoon from which they can extract chakra or restrain it. Moreover, Mido can create barrier seals in mid-air using only chakra. That is, it's not even just burning onto the surface, but pure creation of seals from her own chakra. And the best part is that it works as she constantly sealed my techniques during sparring and then released them immediately. One could say this is the third and highest form of applying Fuinjutsu. Though, I'd be happy to just reach the second level. Just touch the sheet and everything is ready, completely without wasting time. The next morning, our team arrived at the headquarters building 10 minutes before the appointed time. However, Mido was already there earlier, and judging by his appearance, he hadn't left his workplace since the previous evening. His tired expression and the dark circles under his eyes were clear hints. And not only him, as his assistant was also present along with a rather recognizable man from the Hyuga clan. However, instead of the usual mountain of papers on the table, there was now a somewhat crudely drawn map of the neighboring countries with the land of grass, including the land of earth. Most likely, the majority of the map was drawn based on the words of scouts and prisoners, as various handwritten notes indicated the positions of enemy forces, probable surroundings of shinobi military camps, an approximate front line, recently redrawn, and small markers for villages that were too insignificant to be included on the general map, unlike well-known large cities. But the most interesting parts were the small solid and dotted lines marking the enemy shinobi's routes and preferred paths. Unfortunately, 
Even people who can climb walls prefer to avoid the most problematic areas of terrain rather than forcing their way through. Here you are, Mato looked up from the map as we entered the room. Meet your commander for the mission from start to finish, Hyuga Hizashi. Oh! The future head of the branch family of Byakugan owners. Unexpected. However, the guy seems to be about eight years older than me, if memory serves, so he's definitely experienced enough to lead such an operation and not get us all killed. Nara Ryo, Inazuka Tsum, and Karamaru. Ishiro Taro. After introducing ourselves and receiving a nod in response, we turn to the commander for further instructions. Hugasan has already been informed of your capabilities, so you now have 10 minutes to memorize the map and the approximate route to the target, after which you will depart. Is that clear? Yes. In that case, come closer to the table. Mido adjusted the wick on one of the lamps that was holding the large map scroll in place. Due to the recent clearing of the nearest enemy stronghold, you will likely complete the first part of the journey without significant complications, as the number of IWA patrols in the land of Earth has decreased significantly. And crossing the general border with the land of grass will be easy, even using the shortest route. And you will be easily protected from diversionary squads by Hizashi-san. According to the scouts' reports, the concentration of shinobi is very low for about half a day's journey. Ikisen pointed to our location on the map and showed where it is most convenient to infiltrate into the enemy territory. Since most of Awagaku or no Sato's military forces have been destroyed, and the remaining forces are concentrated on opposing our main forces, the number of patrols increases only in the most populated areas or around major cities, such as the ones closest to us, Honkai and Tumaru. Considering that the known courier route is beyond these, you will need to navigate around the dangerous terrain with a large detour, preferably through one of these canyons. Tracing the approximate detour path around the lightly shaded areas on the map around the squares of the named cities, about two days' journey from us, he tapped the paper where the mountainous terrain was marked. Since most of the terrain is rocky, this is how mountains over 20 meters high are marked mainly because higher mountains are even more difficult for shinobi to cross than simply going around. Since there are no cities, not even the most run-down villages due to the complete lack of fertile soil, the chances of encountering observation posts or alert stations are minimal. What about mines? I asked. Although the land of Earth lacks agriculture, its mining industry is quite developed. While the numerous mines only yield a limited range of metals, iron, copper, silver, gold, used by Chakra users. The problem of detecting them is resolved much more easily with Dotan users than with various equipment in my past world. Therefore, developing mines can be located anywhere, even in the wildest areas, if they turn out to be rich in or shinobi are much more adept at traversing than ordinary people and can carry tons of monthly output in a single small scroll. There are none there either, which is to our advantage. Mido grinned. After crossing this terrain, you will find yourselves relatively close to the courier route, but you'll have to make your way through more populated areas. Although there are no large cities nearby, the relatively fertile land is suitable for growing grains, so you might come across a few peasant villages and even a daimyo's governor's estate. Their exact locations are unknown, as is the presence of a Wagakure shinobi in those areas, so you will need to act according to the circumstances. This includes deciding where to set up an ambush. What about the retreat? Some spoke up, focusing on the map. It's best if you retrace your steps, as this is the safest route for a quick withdrawal to our territory in case of unexpected events. Even if a pursuit is organized, you only need to be slightly faster. Just in case, I will send two teams of Jounin to this point in five days. The commander pointed to an area not far from the protected territory where the current front line had been pushed back from our side. So even if someone is on your heels with reinforcements, you'll have the chance to set up an ambush for the pursuers rather than trying to outrun them until you cross to our side. But try not to engage in battles, especially in populated areas, as there are postal birds everywhere and detection will only be a matter of time. So it's better for us to avoid any settlements in enemy territory altogether? I raised an eyebrow questioningly. Considering that among you four, only Rotaro Kuin can pass for a local. It's preferable, the commander sighed, but I understand that this is somewhat impractical, so I have prepared something for such a case. The assistant, who had been standing motionless behind him the entire time, walked around the table 
and handed my partner a small ceiling scroll. A Chun Invest and a high TA from Awagi Cure. Icky explained, both items being clean and undamaged. That's all for now, and if you have any more questions, ask Azasha san Good luck! After saying goodbye to Mido, the four of us followed the temporary commander out onto the street. Ready? The Byakugan bearer turned to us. Along with the others, I padded the pouches where we kept scrolls with supplies and extra weapons. Other, more valuable, scrolls were stored directly in our body seals. Activating his dojitsu, he carefully examined the three of us and turned to me. Narasan, can you conceal your chakra even more? This is my current limit even with the cloak. I shook my head. Although my control was gradually improving, I was still far from the level of concealment achieved by someone like Ishii. Then we'll be more noticeable to good sensors than I had anticipated. Hisashi shook his head. Of course, there is one option. I thoughtfully rubbed my chin, but then you can't count on instant readiness and when using chakra. My level of concealment will return to its previous state. Right now, concealment is more important than combat power. Shrugging, I reached under my clothing and, touching a small seal opposite the source, activated it. At that moment, the chakra flowing into the Kirakukiai was blocked. This was a small preparation I had for such cases. If you can't hide using conventional methods and the cloak can't absorb all the chakra emitted through the Tenketsu, then it's best to eliminate the root cause. That is, block the flow of chakra into the Kirakukiai, thereby reducing the pressure on the Tenketsu. No pressure means no emission. The downside is the relatively small volume of available chakra, which will sooner or later be depleted through movement, leaving me with only the physical capabilities of my body. Of course, this type of blocking isn't perfect, and under sufficient stress, it will fail quickly, but for a while after that I won't be in the best shape. At shinobi speeds, that's almost a guaranteed death. Another drawback is that sensory abilities are heavily dampened. So this seal can only be used when there is support to provide cover for the necessary time. Done. Then let's go. Turning around, Hizashi started towards the camp gates, where a safe path was laid among the traps. We habitually fell in a line behind him. In the middle were Rotaro and Tsum, and I brought up the rear. Since Hizashi had initially set a rather economical pace, and the run to the border of the land of grass and the land of stone would take about an hour, I decided to try to get some information from our commander that might be useful later. So, speeding up a bit, I overtook my partners and their dog and positioned myself next to Hizashi, earning a questioning look from him. More precisely, judging by the eyebrow raised by a millimeter, it was a questioning look. The white-eyed ones can rival stone with their impassive faces. Since we'll be fighting together soon, I'd like to know about your combat capabilities, hizashi -sen. I explained, putting a bit of chakra into my vocal cords for better clarity. Not wanting to miss a word, the others fell in behind us. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.